So hello everyone. Um, I want to. Uh, okay. Okay. Perfect. Thank you. Um, I want to talk to you about something that I think is very important. In an age where Google is saying that the internet, the search internet is over and now we're going into an assistance internet. And I want to talk to you today about decision making. Because decision making, uh, when you're free, is a very important skill to have. But what is it? Decision making is the process of identifying alternatives and being able to choose one of those alternatives depending on your values and preferences. So if you deconstruct decision making, it's, it's in different phases. So the first phase is to frame what they call a decision situation to not call it a problem. So you have to at some point say, there is, I need to make a decision about something. And then you gather information and you generate alternatives, meaning you have access to information and you could take it all in and you have the imagination and the knowledge of alternatives that you're going to go gather. Then you're going to pick one and then you're going to implement it. So those are the different phases. And when you talk about an al a recommendation algorithm, what you're saying is that you're going to automatize the gathering of information and generation of alternative. And that is going to be decided by an algorithm. And I think it's very important to understand how they're made, but also I think it's very important for each and every one of us to be able to make them. So what are they used for? They're used for picking the next movie you're going to watch. They can be used for finding the perfect job or they're they can be used to find the perfect house. So all of those things that have a high impact, except for the movie, it might not be a high impact, it could be. Uh, but the job and the, the house are going to have a huge impact on your well-being, on your capacity to have extra work activities because you're gonna be close to your work. It's a great work, means a lot of mental energy to, to strive for things. So those are very important situations and decisions to make and they have huge impact and we can automate it. We can make it more powerful because we have computers that can do that. So let's see how they're made. As any algorithms, recommendation algorithms have input, process and output. I like meringues. <laughs> <laughs> so let's look at input. Um, okay, let's look at input. Uh, they have two types of input. One, you're, you're wondering about the, the geese. I can see that. Uh, because there is no stock photo of air. Uh, this is the closest I got. <laughs> so, okay, so the explicit uh, input are what you're going to see in a recipe. In a recipe, it's going to ask for two eggs to whip them up. They're never going to ask you to have air on hand. <laughs> so the explicit ingredient is eggs. The implicit input is the air. Well, uh, for recommendation algorithm, same thing. You have explicit input. For example, how many stars you put at a film on a film uh, on Netflix? That's the explicit input. The implicit input would be, for example, the time you spend watching that movie. It's something, it's just looking at your behavior and saying, oh, this is what it means. So it just, it's just taking in that, that, the taking in that data. So let's look at the process. Well, for recommendation algorithms, there are two types of processes. There is collaborative filtering. So let's say that this is Alex and this is Sam. And Alex and Sam both like strawberries and ice cream. So we're going to say, oh, they're similar. They both like the same things. But we can see that uh, Sam also likes video games. So we're going to say that Alex also might like and might want to buy video games. That's how they work. The other type of, um, of recommendation algorithms are called content-based. So we still have Alex who likes strawberries and ice cream. And we say, oh, this is a raspberry pie. pie. It's a pie. It's a raspberry pie. So she likes fruits that are red. And this is a red fruit. 
so she might want to buy it. So <laughs> here, you know about recommendation algorithms. They take explicit and implicit input, and there are two main types, and they're not exclusive, those two types. So you can mix and match them and make even greater uh, recommendation algorithms. But what is very interesting about al uh, recommendation algorithms are their output. Because their output truly reflect the values and the preferences of the implementer. So decision making is about the values and preferences of the decision maker. And recommendation algorithms are about <coughs> the preferences and value of the implementer of the algorithms. So what we see in the output of recommendation algorithms are some really great things. They allow discovery, meaning that you can sift through a huge amount of data. They allow variety and discovering things that you would never have known about, but you, there's someone somewhere who has the similar profile and likes something. And finally, it allows a sense of community, finding people who have the same taste, the same strivings, and being able to say, oh, you know, oh, I found this person and they seem to be really cool. And I use that a lot on Twitter. So sometimes I'm really happy about that algorithm. And sometimes I'm not. Sometimes they have very horrible uh, ways of showing up. Kind of like when they show you this person you really want to forget about on Facebook saying, hey, do you know that person? <laughs> and like, yeah, I do. It doesn't mean I want to, you know, ever think about them again. <laughs> Or there is that terrifying uh, story about this algorithm that um, this lady, and she had an app to follow her pregnancy. And sadly, she had a miscarriage. Uh, but the app didn't uh, prevent, um, so they sold their data because that's how, what, you know, how ad, uh, apps get their money. And so she kept on getting uh, coupons for uh, pregnancy and then like small kids stuff. Um, and that's the darker side of recommendation algorithms, is that they don't represent <coughs> the values and preferences of the users. They represent the value and preferences of the implementer. So let's look at the implementer. Corporations! <laughs> <laughs> um, and that has some very negative effects that only corporations right now are implementing those algorithms. The first thing is, how do they know if they have a good algorithm? How do they read it? What is their, their system to know, you know what, we've, we've made an improvement on this. What they do is that they look at engagement. If they can predict that you will engage with a result, then they're saying, you know, we're good. Meaning if they recommend a film, the fact that you're gonna click on that film means that the, the algorithm is good. But sometimes we engage because of our bias, because of our beliefs, because of our habits. We don't engage with the thing that will serve us the most. For example, I tend to engage with sweet things more than bitter things. So I will engage more with a meringue than with an egg white omelet, even though the input of two eggs is pretty much the same. And they know that. They know that I tend to go for the sweet thing. So what they're going to do, because they want me to get engaged, they're gonna just serve me sweet things all the time because they know what, that's what I engage with. Even though I wanna go for the egg white omelet. I don't really wanna go for the egg white omelet because you know, it, it's not my thing, but it's white and it looks like meringues. Um, <laughs> so they know that and so they're gonna keep on feeding me this thing that I like, the things that I believe, and the things that confirm everything I stand for. Meaning that they will go for my confirmation bias every time. And that gets us into filter bubbles. It gets us not interested in about what other people think and kind of in that very sweet space. And as citizen, it might not always be what we want, but we don't control them, we don't make them, corporations do and they want us engaged. The other things that cooperation do is that they show us output without showing us in either the input or the process. 
meaning that we only see the meringue, but we don't really know what went in it, and we don't really know if it was beaten by an electric egg beater or a kid somewhere out in a very poor country that had no choice whatsoever in beating eggs. That, ref that metaphor is not as great as I thought. Uh, <laughs> um, so again, the output, what it represents are the values and the preferences of the corporation impl implementing it. And I got to use the fire um, <laughs> thing. Uh, and meaning that it all comes down to trust. It's not even about trust, it's about choice. Do we have a choice? And as long as we're not making our own recommendation algorithm, each and every one of us, we don't have that choice. So let's do this. Let's all make our own recommendation algorithms to make really great decisions. But there's a problem. <laughs> that this is where you get after 10 hours of coding, and this is where you need to be to make a recommendation algorithm. And it's scary because each and every one of us as a society don't have time to do this. So thank uh, society for making easier ways. Now we have recommend, uh, recommendation algorithm as a service. We have open source recommendation algorithms and that's great if you already know how to develop one. If you don't know anything about coding, you're still far away from being able to implementing one. And that's the trouble with incremental simplification is that they're simplifying not for everyone, they're simplifying for people who already know how to make them. So how do we drastically lower that ceiling? How do we make it possible for everyone to make those recommendation algorithm? Well, why would we want to do this first? Because it's going to be a lot of effort. Um, we heard a little earlier today uh, that the fact that we had better tools and simpler tools to make video games allowed for a variety of games to be able to reach a wider audience. And having that diversity means we're going to be making better video games in the future and not video games that reflect the view of a teenage white male. And that's great. Um, so the thing we need to do is to simplify drastically but is it ethical to have that layer, that level up of abstraction? Don't we also integrate bias when we simplify solution? Well, if you think about it, as soon as there is a recommendation algorithm as a service, we have already, we have this level of abstraction. So the question is, do you have to have those credentials as a developer to use it, or can anyone use it? And it's, as long as you have that le level of abstraction of being able to use someone else's service, you have that ethical question, but we don't ask it of developers. We don't ask them to have permission. So why should the general public need permission to use them? So I want to talk about software, not, that, not as a technical solution, but as a human like the need of human solution. And if, uh, I took this from If This Then That, and the way they're talking about a technical <coughs> solution is how it's solving a human problem. And the human problem is, I don't know where my phone is. And that's a very human problem. And, and behind that, you have APIs that will be used. And most people don't know what an API is. Most people don't have a clue what an API is. But they don't need to. They don't need to know, to know that they can find their phone with that level of abstraction. And I think that's very powerful. So how do we do that for code? Well, the way we learn about cooking, the way I learned about cooking, is to first know like general ideas about what the like different dishes were and different um, components, ingredients were, and then how to mix them to have lowest effort for maximum impact. That's not how I learned how to code. To learn how to code, I'm learning for a very long time to have very low impact, and I'm spending a lot of time having low impact so that someday I will have very high impact. And it seems kind of backwards. It seems like it's a test, like if you can keep with this for like hours and hours and hours on it, you will have this, this power, this magical power. 
So with food, what do we do? Well, we have general concept and we say, you know, let's give people information about what they're buying. Let's give simple, understandable information such as list of ingredients. And the first one is the most common one. <coughs> so let's imagine that on GitHub. So please, <coughs> this is my, I'm not a designer, so this is my designing skills. It's, uh, it's not bad. Um, so let's say that we have a logo to say this is a recommending uh, algorithm. And let's say we have a logo that says, oh, you know, it's a, it's a collaborative filtering one. And then we could, the way we have the ingredient list on an already prepared dish, we could have a data list knowing everything that it takes in and their influence on the, on the result at the end. How easy would it be to make a decision if you knew, oh, this, this algorithm, it takes all the movies I've already se seen, but I'd rather have this one that takes my friends list because I have friends who have great movie taste. And that's the level you need to make a decision. Knowing how it's made inside, maybe you can wait for have, you know, you can wait a few years to know that. But those are the information that, that's decision making level of information. Another thing we use uh, in, uh, we can use are archetypes and models that users already have. Instead of talking about loops and if then statement, Let's talk about stories. Let's talk about Alice and Bob. I mean, Alice and Bob, they showed up for the first time in a research paper. They're not tools used to explain cryptography to little kids. They're tools used to communicate between humans about something that is very complex. So let's tell stories about our algorithms. Let's tell stories about our services. And the other things that we've seen, and again, if this, then that, because they use that level of abstraction for APIs, uh, they use grammar. They use grammar that we know how to use already to talk about algorithms. And they don't show you one line of code. And that's okay. Because for most of us, it's not about coding. It's about solving problems. So all of this, all of this talk is about freedom of choice. Because the per people who generate alternatives, the people who gather information for us, will some, at the end, decide how we make decisions. And in the age of assistance, it's very important for every one of us to know how the information is gathered and what alternatives are shown to us, and especially what alternatives are not shown to us. So this is why I think that we all should make recommendation algorithms, and I would love to hear your thought on this. So I prepared a t some time for Q&A if you want. <laughs>